You are listening to the Mark Guzman Podcast Experience. This episode and wine tasting is sponsored by Lanny Clark with Prime Lending. Lanny Clark is a loan officer specializing in residential home lending. He communicates with you every step of the way and his honesty sets him apart from the rest. He's able to think outside of the box due to his experience and is able to tailor a loan program to fit your needs. If you can't qualify just yet, not a problem. He will let you know what you need to do in order to be ready. Lanny is also backed by Prime Lending, which is one of the biggest and fastest growing lending banks in the nation. They have simplified the home lending process down to five steps. And FYI, step number five is to relax and enjoy your new home. So contact Lanny Clark today at 510-964-0620. For the past 19 years, Congressman Mike Thompson has represented the 5th District of California in the U.S. House of Representatives. One of the first moves he made when he joined the House was to create the Congressional Wine Caucus, which is composed of over 140 members of Congress and works to educate the American people on the importance of wine growing in America while working to fight for the rights of American wine growers everywhere. Today, Congressman Thompson is our guest, and we will talk to him about his involvement in the Wine Caucus and what it is doing to help wine growers. We will also dive into the political process itself and get a first-hand account of what life on the House floor really looks like. This is a can't-miss episode that we hope you will find not just entertaining, but informative and educational. Congressman Mike Thompson, thank you for coming in. My pleasure. Good to be here. Yeah. So one thing I'd like to start off with every single guest is basically ask you what's got your attention right now. So it could be a book, a movie, something in politics, out of politics. What has your attention right now? Well, right now, I think everybody's familiar with what is seemingly uh, big time dysfunction in Washington. <laughs> and so I, I spend most of my time um, either in Washington or in the district worrying about what is or isn't happening in Washington. So right now it's a district work period. I'm, I'm home this week uh, in the district uh, meeting with community groups from throughout all five of our uh, of the counties that are in our district and hearing their issues, their concerns, and trying to figure out how I can bring those issues back to Washington uh, and make uh, life better for our district. Mm -hmm. Now, you're a uh, congressman for the 5th District. Correct. Now, many people are not quite familiar, especially some of the uh, viewers and listeners, with what that district covers. So what are the areas that the district covers? It's all of Napa County and part of Sonoma, Lake, Solano, and Contra Costa County. And the southern border is Highway 4. So I represent half of Martinez, okay. the, the, the northern half, uh, Highway 4 being the separation. And then Pinole, Hercules, Rodale, and Crockett. In Solano County, it's Vallejo and Benicia. In Sonoma County, it's a little – I have, I have a, a couple of neighborhoods in Petaluma, but, uh, but very little of Petaluma. I have uh, Rohnert Park, uh, Katati, Pengrove, the town of Sonoma, and most of Santa Rosa. Okay, and so said, pretty large area. Oh, yeah. And as I said, all of Napa and then the southern half of, of Lake County. So Lakeport, Kelseyville, Middletown, Hidden Valley Lake, mm -hmm. Cobb. So you're also a local boy. You were born and raised in St. Helena, correct? Because I'm a native of the 5th Congressional District, and I've lived here my entire life. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, let's get into what made you first get into politics because that's always very interesting like what led you into politics what's your origin story well i um i i was late going back to school i went back to uh, college after i got out of the military i came home i worked in the wine industry and then I, my wife and i both went back to school she was uh, she was a science major from uh, university of indiana and she moved to california uh, met me and uh, didn't finish school. And so we both went back to school later in life. Uh, I, I was working for, uh, working in the wine uh, community. I left my job. She had a small business. She sold her business. We went back to school together. And uh, she had some uh, additional time. She went back and got a, a nursing degree. And she had a little more time. 
uh, I was asked, I, I stayed and taught uh, at uh, Chico State, and I was asked by a professor to apply for a fellowship in uh, Sacramento, a fellowship with the state legislature, and I applied and I won. And uh, so I did that for, uh, for a year. And then when I got out of school, uh, when I got out of the internship, she got out of school, uh, I stayed on and, and worked for a member of the, of the legislature. And folks at home came to me and asked me if I would run for office, run for the state senate. Uh, they had some uh, issues with the existing uh, uh, state senator, and, and I did, and, and I won. And I served uh, eight years, my two terms. Uh, back then, you could only serve two terms in the senate. So I finished my two terms, and constituents uh, wanted me to stay in in, in public office and uh, persuaded me to run for the uh, congressional seat in our district, and, and I did, and, uh, and here I am. <laughs> now, you were in the Army, right? I was. So how did being in the military, and by the way, thank you for your service, thank too, you. and how did your experience in the military help you get to where you're at today? Well, I, th- I, I, I think it helped me immensely. Um, I, I can tell you that the, uh, the the military really turned my life around. I was uh, I, I didn't do well in school. As a matter of fact, I was one of those guys that uh, knew for a fact that I knew more than my parents and my teachers and <laughs> every other adult in the, in, in the neighborhood. And uh, after my last basketball season, I quit high school, and I tried to go to a community college, but. You know, I knew more than the community college teachers also, and I ended up in the Army. So I, I, I went in, and, and I, I learned a lot, of, uh, a, a, a lot about myself, and I learned a lot about discipline and focus. Um, you know, I went on. I was, in, I was in Vietnam. I was a, a platoon leader in, in the uh, uh, Airborne, uh, 173rd Airborne Brigade in Vietnam. And uh, I came home uh, a lot smarter than I was, and and had uh, I was probably in the army for about an hour and a half uh, when I realized that my parents and teachers were smarter than I'd given them credit for. <laughs> so I, I got out of the army with a GED, and uh, came back and as I said worked in the wine industry, and then uh, went to community college. And then after my community college uh, work was done, that's when my wife and I uh, went back to, I quit my job, she sold her her business, and we went back to school. Uh, I've got my undergraduate degree, and then went to a community college uh, and and, and took two classes to make up for what I didn't do in high school. And then I got a graduate degree. So I have a GED, an undergraduate degree, a high school diploma, and a master's degree in that order. Wow. <laughs> so the Army helped me a lot. I think I probably got a lot more out of the Army than they got out of me. Mm-hmm. And then, so what year did you end up growing grapes? Uh, I've grown grapes a couple of times in my life. Um, my first time what must have been 1970-something uh, when I— uh, I worked for Behringer Winery, okay. and, and they uh, amassed a lot of property in the Napa Valley, and they, they went on a buying spree. They have spree. a great location. They have a wonderful yeah. location. But uh, they went on a buying spree. They bought property, and then they just they accumulated a lot of property, and then they went through a process, a culling process, uh, planting some, uh, not planting some, uh, trying to determine what best fit you know, their portfolio. And they had a 10-acre piece that uh, they ended up not planting, and they leased it out for, uh, for a hay operation. And when they decided to sell, when they decided to sell their uh, surplus property, uh, my best friend and I bought that 10 acres. Uh, we worked it, uh, and we, we planted it ourselves and, and started a, a, a vineyard. And then um, I planted grapes again in, uh, oh, it must have been 19... It must have been 2000, 2001, uh, planted uh, grapes on the ranch that I have now. And uh, it was a, a deal. My wife and I had a rental house that we sold, and uh, we used the money to, uh, to buy a, a, a rice ranch in uh, Calusa County. And she didn't see any pleasure in uh, having a rice ranch outside of the district that you know, we really <laughs> couldn't use as a family. So we had that for a couple of years, and we sold it. And then took that money and bought an uh, an old uh, pear orchard in in Lake County. And then we uh, developed that into the vineyard we have now. Lake County is pretty beautiful. I had an aunt that lived up there for probably eight years, 
maybe a little bit longer. It's very beautiful. I used to go up there all the time. It's a beautiful area. Uh, it reminds me today of what Napa Valley was like when I was growing up. Uh, it's, it's more rural than, uh, than, than Napa. Uh, they're developing a lot of, uh, a lot of vineyards up there. Uh, agriculture is, is very prominent. Uh, there, uh, there, there are more e- uh, places to eat, uh, the, uh, more going on in, in town. Mm-hmm. Uh, the people are absolutely wonderful. They're uh, dedicated to their community and to their neighbors. And it's, it's just a pleasure to be up there growing grapes and knowing those folks. Yeah. Now, speaking of grapes and wine, we have two bottles of wine here. Uh, one of them, the one for the people watching, is a Reynolds. Uh, it's the red wine uh, provided by our sponsor, Lanny Clark, with Prime Lending. Now, the white wine over here is from your vineyard. Is that it correct? Is. It is. So, let's see. When was this? Uh, so, this is Sauvignon Blanc, uh, Lake County, Mendocino County, and Sonoma County. So, you have grapes from uh, three different areas. The late, Well, the wine's not mine. Uh, the uh, uh, Fetzer owns this label. Okay. Uh, bon Terra is Fetzer's organic label. And uh, they buy grapes from me, and they put it in this wine. So the Lake County grapes uh, that are, it's, it's, a, a th- it's a three Appalachia uh, 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 vin- uh, uh, wine, uh, as you said, Mendocino, Sonoma, and Lake. And the Lake grapes are, a, 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 a lot of the percentage of the Lake grapes are, are mine, come from my ranch. Okay. That's pretty neat. And I also uh, sell grapes to uh, Honig Winery. So if you're drinking a bottle of Bonterra or a bottle of Honig Sauvignon Blanc, uh, you're uh, enjoying some of the uh, some wine from, made from the fruit that I grow. Very cool. So would you say you're a bit of a wine connoisseur? I can say that I like wine. <laughs> <laughs> I can certainly tell the difference between red and white. Yeah. <laughs> Well, let's give, uh, we've got Reynolds poured, so let's give it a taste. And by the way, cheers, and thanks for coming on to the podcast. That's very really good. good. They do a great job. I, I know the family. Uh, they're, they're very, very generous in the community. They do a lot. They make a fantastic wine. It's What's better, good people and good wine? You, just, yeah. you, you can't beat that. What is uh, one of your favorite wineries in Napa? Or yeah, you know I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> you want, you You've want, got quite a while few. While you're though. at it, would you like me to tell you which one of my sons I like the best? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there are a lot of great wines in, uh, in the 5th Congressional District. Is there a winery that you think should have a lot more attention? Well, I think all of them should have more attention. Uh, you know, I... I heard the other day that they're uh, they're trying to make wine in Australia and in France, mm-hmm. and uh, I I was I was shocked. Why why would anybody want to drink a wine from France or from Australia? And we've got the best <laughs> wine in the world. We should you know, we should focus on home. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I mean, if you look at the different wine trends, Australia wines today are probably very similar to what uh, Malbec wines were maybe ten or fifteen years ago. And you see them up and coming, trending here in the U.S. So they're, well, they're starting to come up. Yeah. But I, I joke about it, but the truth of the matter is they, they're making wine every place now. Uh, we make wine in all 50 states now. Um, clearly, our district is the epicenter for great wine. We, we make the best wine uh, in, in, in the world. But um, I was just, uh, day before yesterday, at the ribbon cutting for the new uh, uh, wine, uh, the new building for the Wine Institute at Sonoma State, the Wine Wine Learning Center at Sonoma State, and uh, the Wine Institute uh, made a big contribution to help retrofit a, a building, uh, along with Gary Heck uh, from Corbell Cellars up in Sonoma County. Mm-hmm. Uh, he put a bunch of money in, and then the community rallied. Uh, they're they're going to have they have a wine education program there, so. A lot of people uh, see the bottle in the store or the wine in the glass, and uh, they don't really think about what's behind that. The truth of the matter is there's a lot. Uh, the people who grow the grapes are, are behind this. And, and I can tell your listeners without any hesitation that there are wineries that can take the best fruit in the world and mess it up and make a bad wine. But there's not a winery in the world that can take bad fruit and make a good wine. 
Mm-hmm. So uh, the, the farming part is essential. So that's where it starts. Uh, the ground, the terroir, the climate, uh, the, how you take care of the grapes, the people that take care of those grapes, the guy driving the tractor, the people pruning the vine, the people tying the vine, those making sure that during frost season uh, the, the, and, and they don't get the, uh, the, the buds aren't, aren't burned. Uh, the, the, the whole deal is, uh, is a collection of wonderfully uh, trained and hardworking individuals and uh, mixed with great science and management to get that best fruit uh, forward. And then uh, once you get the fruit done and, you, and you, you go through the process of making the wine, there's a whole cadre of business individuals behind that label. It's not just you know the little old winemaker me business. <laughs> yeah. you know, it, it, it's a business. And uh, there's people that have to figure out uh, how, to, how to pay the bills, uh, how to pay the taxes, uh, how to uh, sell the wine, how to market the wine. Uh, and, and Sonoma State has recognized that, and there, were, there, was, a, there was a void uh, at the, at, in, in academia about that. So they did this uh, wine program, and, and then the building uh, followed. So they have their own home now in this, in this new building, or renovated uh, building. And when I was taking the tour before the ribbon cutting, uh, they have a, a distance learning program. Uh, uh, an area in the building for, for distance learning. And I was told that... Uh, now, what's distance learning? So you can uh, take classes or share research uh, from someplace other than the campus. Okay. And they have uh, other countries who are already signed up working with the, uh, uh, the, uh, the center at Sonoma State. Uh, France and uh, Australia both uh, are students i guess you would say mm-hmm. uh in that uh in in that program so it's a it's a worldwide uh effort and uh and everybody's plugged in and everybody isn't that amazing like it, how it, much the internet's just like evolved every industry just in oh, the yeah. last 20 30 years well, you know what's amazing to me and you know certainly technology has changed things a lot uh you can you can sit in a classroom in France and take classes from Sonoma State. That was very, very. That was impossible uh, when you know when I was going to school. It's not even. You don't even give it a second thought in uh, in, in today's world. And but what has always been uh, present in the wine community was this unbelievable willingness to share information. And I've always said that if uh, a grape grower or a winery found the silver bullet on Tuesday by Wednesday everybody would know about it so there's not this you don't you don't have this proprietary uh, uh, environment where no we we found this new thing and we're not going to share it with you because uh, the folks in our district recognize that uh, everybody does well everybody else does well and you, you, so it's like you a very it. collective knowledge then. Oh, yeah. yeah. And you've seen it. They're very, very protective. Um, you know, that's why, um, well, like uh, an American viticulture area, which would be a designation on a bottle of wine. So if you go into a, a store and you see a bottle of wine, if it says Napa Valley on it, that means that a significant percentage of the grapes were grown in the Napa Valley. 75% it, at least, right? Yes. And it says, if, if it says, um, uh, Rutherford Cabernet, then you know that wine came from the Rutherford uh, American Viticulture area. And here not too long ago, uh, we were trying to, the Calistoga uh, folks were trying to get a Calistoga appellation for their uh, designation through the AVA system. And they got it, there was a guy up there that uh, registered and was approved for a la- for two two different people were approved for labels with Calistoga in the name, hmm. and it it caused a lot of problems in, in the industry, and uh, people and, and they neither one of these folks were using grapes from Calistoga, to make their uh, to make their wine. In fact, they they weren't even you one of them wasn't even using Napa Valley grapes to make their wine, and people were rightfully fearful that that goes out on the shelf. Somebody, especially somebody new to wine, comes in and says, "Oh, I, I, Calistoga is a uh, prominent grape growing area in the Napa Valley. This must be good." And then they pour the wine, and it's grapes from someplace else, and it's not good. 
that that sours that person on not only Calistoga, but very possibly Napa Valley. So they're very, very protective of, of that. And they want to make sure that everybody that's participating is participating at the highest standard. So they don't want somebody to make, you know, be making bad farming decisions or bad winemaking decisions, which weights down the entire community. Yeah, and that makes total sense, yeah. too. Now, one thing I didn't know existed in Congress was a wine caucus. And so when did the wine caucus start? How many members are there? And what's your role in the wine caucus? Well, the wine caucus started the year I got to Congress. And <clears throat> I was elected in 1998. And there was another California member of Congress, George Rodanovich, from the Mariposa area. And George had a small winery. So I came to him and I said, uh, let's start a wine caucus. And he was all in. Uh, we started it. Uh, we had, uh, at one point, we had about 250 members, both the House uh, and the Senate. 250? 250. And we were able to do uh, events, and, and I, you know, I won't, I won't uh, try and uh, 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 fool you. Uh, some of our events were wine tastings. <laughs> <laughs> it was just an opportunity for people to get together and have a glass of wine and talk about the wine. Uh, but we had a very serious side also. Uh, we had uh, we had policy uh, provisions that we uh, we we uh, we came together to form uh, when there was the uh, when the glassy wing sharpshooter uh, started devastating vineyards in California nearly wiped out the uh, grape growing region in Temecula uh, the there were other industries that were host uh, industries for that vector uh, the citrus industry and the commercial nurseries, the ornamental uh, nurseries. They would, uh, the, the uh, uh, vector would attach to these plants or to the citrus, and, uh, and they, they didn't hurt the ornamental plants, they didn't hurt the citrus, but they'd fly next door and, uh, and infect the surrounding vineyards. So it was our wine caucus that brought all, the, all those industries together and said, hey, it, it may not hurt you, but you're hurting everybody else. So let's figure out uh, how we can combat this thing and, uh, and, and, and save a very, very important uh, industry. So there's been a number of policy issues that we've gotten involved in, uh, in particular uh, funding for research. Uh, uh, there's a couple of agricultural schools in California that do a great deal of research in regard to grapes <coughs> and wine. <coughs> so we've helped uh, let folks understand what that means. We've been the conduit from bringing, for bringing information from the ground to Washington, D.C. So policymakers know uh, what's important and what's needed for grape growing and, and for the production mm -hmm. of wine. Because remember, um, you hear a lot about uh, the amount of wine that's sold. I think it's about $60 billion a year, uh, wine uh, from our area that's sold. But the wine uh, community is responsible for about $180 billion worth of economic activity. Wow. So anytime that bottle of wine is sold, you know that there's people that farmed. And so uh, all the equipment, if it's a if it's a disc, if it's a cultipactor, if it's a hoe plow, if it's a, a tractor, you know, somebody bought that in order to grow them. Uh, the folks that are pruning the vines and tying the vines, they get their paycheck. They go downtown and, and do something. All these folks pay taxes on that, and that's taxes that come right back into the community for schools, for health care, uh, for, uh, for, for transportation. And then that just ripples across the country. Uh, every restaurant that serves Reynolds uh, Cabernet or Bon Terra Sauvignon Blanc, they have a staff, they have chefs. People come in, want a nice bottle of wine to drink uh, with their meal. Uh, that, that just that furthers the economic impact uh, so, of the wine community. So the wine caucus steps in to even help create legislation for like shipping wines across state lines. For Absolutely, that, and that's a big issue, as, as you probably know. Uh, states have control over uh, their uh, wine shipping laws, mm -hmm. and uh, there's been attempts to even uh, s to even strengthen uh, that state ability uh, in Congress. And we work pretty hard to make sure that any legislation dealing with shipping uh, is fair and, and, and equitable. And uh, we've done uh, 
we, we've done a number of things. We've done uh, the marketing programs that, uh, that the uh, uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, uses. Uh, we've been able to, to work with them on that. So, so how's the, how did the drought in California affect grape growers? Well, uh, you know, growers and, uh, and wineries have pretty much perfected their abilities in, in, our, in our district. So if you have a, uh, a dry year, uh, it, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, you know, they, uh, uh, oftentimes that uh, the lack of water uh, puts more stress on the vine, uh, leading to uh, uh, an effect on the, on the fruit. Uh, uh, and it could be a good effect. The more st- uh, the more stress could you know could uh, intensify the flavors, things like that. Um, there's always a, a problem with the drought, and, and you see it. Uh, the thing that worries me is uh, during frost season because I I protect with overhead water sprinklers, and uh, the, a lot of people do. And if your well runs dry and you have a freeze uh, during the during the uh, uh, budding uh, time of the year that you could lose everything so that's always a concern uh, we've we've dodged the the bullet uh, a little bit i know some guys were impacted more than others i have one friend that has uh, about 15 acres of grapes in sonoma and in the big drought he was trucking water in to fill his pond wow so that he was out of water completely he had to truck water in, fill his pond, in order to. Uh, How uh, much does that protect. cost him? It cost a ton of money, and you can only imagine uh, what that meant. And and then and uh, again, this, these are jobs on the line. So his vineyard, somebody takes care of it for him, and that somebody buys tractors, and that somebody hires pruners, and they hire pickers. So if it's disrupted, not only is he out the money, but his workforce is out of work. Mm-hmm. Now, how much does the wine caucus get involved with uh, shipping wine globally across, you know, maybe like U.S. to Canada, yeah. and vice versa? Uh, not not a lot. Uh, I can't think of any foreign shipping issues that we're involved in. I know that uh, right now uh, Canada uh, is, I believe, in violation of some of our uh, trade agreements and there, there's a problem with U.S. wine going into Canada. And I've been pretty involved with that, working through our trade ambassador and the Department of Commerce. So what's uh, the problem with U.S. wine going into Canada right now? Well, uh, the, uh, the Canadian laws favor Canadian wine over U.S. wine, and, and that's a problem. So it gives them uh, an upper hand uh, in, in regard to marketing. It's real hard to get in stores up there. Uh, shelf placement is a problem, and it's in violation of our trade agreements. Okay. China, um, for a while, has been, um, they, were, they were counterfeiting. They had, a, uh, they had a deal going on, and I don't know that I'll pronounce it correctly. I think it was Napa Fungu, uh, roughly translated Napa Valley. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so uh, they were making wine in China, putting it in a bottle with Napa Valley in Chinese uh, on the label. And that's a violation. And uh, so I feel like uh, you hear a lot about that these days. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All kinds of products, including Apple and Samsung and cell phones, right? <laughs> yep. So I got involved uh, with, with that. That doesn't seem to be uh, too much of a problem anymore. Uh, one of the issues that's really troubling is uh, this president uh, has. Uh, and uh, I know they said today they're not starting trying to start a trade war, uh, but putting these tariffs on steel and aluminum has started a trade war. Yeah. And I know wine is already experiencing it. And I know I, I think the number I think I think we're 42 percent tariff uh, into China and it's gone up to 68 percent tariff. And that's an emerging mar- uh, world market. So a lot of uh, wine folks trying to get their product into China. You had a 68 percent uh, tariff on top of uh, the the price of the wine. It pretty much excludes you and gives an unfair advantage to uh, European wines. Yeah, I've heard multiple things about the uh, about that trade war and the tariffs on steel and alum- aluminum. Correct. Correct. And I've heard on one side where it really doesn't affect us as much, but then what's come out of that afterwards is now you have other countries saying 
well, if you're going to do this, here's what right. we're going to do. Right, they retaliate. Exactly. And the whole idea, I know the Secretary of Commerce uh, was real quick when this was first talked about. He said, oh, uh, there's this, this means nothing. It's not going to affect, uh, uh, affect America at all. And by definition, uh, he's wrong. You know, mm-hmm. you, you, you don't uh, increase the price of a raw material uh, and expect to get no impact from that. You know, if you, you know that. Yeah. And, you know, if, if all of a sudden, you, if you want to buy a new car and all of a sudden they say, well, uh, they just increased the steel cost and it's, it's going to be $2,000 more uh, to make your car, they're not going to just, you know, eat that and give you the car at the old price. That's going to be factored in. And we're seeing it, as I say, with wine. You can't go from 42% to 68% and say it's not going to have an effect. If you're a, a winemaker, if you're a winery in California and you're trying to put wine uh, into the market in China and they just increased by 26% uh, your tariff or whatever that what the difference was, what did I say, 40, 48, 42 40, and 68, yeah. 26%, um, you're you're going to feel that. Sorry about that. You know yeah. they say there's three types of people when it comes to math: those who can do it and those who can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh, and I believe there's also additional taxes or tariffs on solar panels coming in. Correct. 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 Yeah, and, and I know I believe um, the cost of solar panels have gone up about almost thirty percent. Something, something yeah, I don't crazy know like what the number yeah. is, but anytime you start, uh, anytime you increase the cost of, of material used in the manufacturing of whatever it is, uh, there's somebody's going to pay for that. Yeah, yeah, and, and now solar panels are costing more, and now California requires every brand new home to be developed with solar panels. So now the cost of construction mm-hmm. and same thing with cars that gets passed on to the consumer. Correct. Yeah. So, how does climate change? affect wine growers and the wine industry i mean it is i know climate change is a big debate um there's no debate about climate change yeah uh, there shouldn't be a debate yeah well there shouldn't be any place and there's certainly not any debate in the uh in the agricultural side of the uh, of the ledger uh farmers know and um and winery owners know that uh, any time uh, temperatures fluctuate, there, there's going to be some sort of impact from that. And uh, you see it in um, in um, uh, the the hotter days. That means something for the for the fruit. Um, you, do you when you uh, you have enough canopy to protect the grapes from being burned. Uh, does it? Do they ripen too fast? There's a whole bunch of uh, of things that people are are, are concerned about. So and I would imagine the wine growers have to be on top of the absolutely. climate. They're I mean, changing farming practices all the time. Uh, you see uh, uh, wineries and 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 growers uh, growing in different parts of the country now, uh, and that's uh, climate change has certainly had uh, some uh, some influence uh, on that. But also uh, pest problems. You know, when the chi- climate change uh, when, when the climate changes, uh, that affects what pests you have uh, in or out of your vineyard. Mm-hmm. And uh, so there's, I think the uh, farm uh, advisors told me here not too long ago, uh, there's an unbelievably uh, steep number of new pests that are coming into California all the time. And, yeah. it's, and it's climate influenced. Wow. So, so let's say you want to introduce legislation to help out uh, the wine industry or any, anything else that is catching your attention. How easy or how difficult is it, is it to introduce a bill? Oh, anybody can introduce a bill. You just have to <clears throat> take your subject matter to the uh, legislative council, ask them to write the bill for you, uh, sign your name, and drop it in the hopper. That's so, easy. Yeah. The, <laughs> trick, the trick is getting it uh, out of the Congress onto the president's desk for a signature. Yeah, and getting that support behind it, right? Correct. So how many bills have you introduced yourself or sponsored over your career? Uh, a couple hundred. A couple hundred. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot. I have a uh, wall in my office that um, I have uh, every bill that I've ever had signed into law on that wall. And it covers, oh, that's very cool. It covers a pretty good part of the, uh, of the, uh, of the, of the office. And uh, 
I've, I've had some pretty good bills signed into law. I'm pretty proud of that. What's your uh, ratio of completion, actually signing into law compared to? Oh, I don't what know. Uh, a lot of times you write a bill, and um, that bill doesn't get passed, but it gets the the the, uh, the material in the bill gets added to something else. So mm -hmm. I don't know how you could uh, how you could uh, factor that out. Yeah, I just know that the bill, and then too, uh, if you co-sponsor a bill with someone, you know. It, just because that person doesn't do what's necessary to get their bill passed, you know that that does that shouldn't count against the co-authors. Yeah, you know. Um, now you're co. You announced recently that you're going to co-sponsor, correct? A regulation on what? Um, this is. Uh, let's see. I think it's on your website here. Regarding term limits on using. Uh, force, military force in the Middle East. Oh, yeah. Uh, the um, the um, authorization for the use of military force is uh, something that is, I think, an important issue. Uh, the idea that uh, we are still operating under the same authorization uh, that we passed uh, in 2001 after 9-11. You know, things have changed. I don't think we should be operating on the same uh, on, on the same uh, um, uh, authorization. You know, we ought to reevaluate where we're going, reevaluate what we're doing, and reevaluate how we get out of what we're doing. So right now, the president is able to basically use force as needed without any, is any it consultation place, with Congress. Any place in the world where the president sees a nexus to the measure that was passed in 2001. Okay. And I think that's given a little bit too much power. Yeah. I think Congress needs to be involved uh, in the debate on what we do militarily. And right now, I think it's written loosely enough where Congress can be excluded. Well, I, bl I believe before 2001, and correct me if I'm wrong, if the president wanted to use military force, he would always have to go back to Congress to well, yes and no. There's a period. Uh, a president can still use military force and come back to Congress for approval, you know, because if there was an emergency, you know, that uh, we would be able to uh, uh, to to deal with that. But uh, this is a little bit different situation. This is this was an authorization that was passed, and has has been the sole authorization for all of this time, and I, I think 17 years is enough. Mm -hmm. So what's the uh, political process at D.C. in trying to build up support? What are some things that you look for when you're introducing a bill? Well, I think it, um, it depends upon the bill. I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, a, a bill that I introduced uh, fairly uh, uh, recently was a bill to uh, give the Veterans Administration the authorization to uh, take over the military uh, cemetery on Mare Island. And there's an historic cemetery there. Um, there's folks buried there uh, going back to the War of 1812. Um, there's very important, uh, you know, uh, uh, highly visible uh, military folks buried there. There's three uh, members of the military who were uh, the recipients of the Congressional Medal of Honor are buried there. Uh, Francis Scott Key's daughter and grandchildren are buried there. And when they closed Mare Island, they transferred ownership of the island to the city of Vallejo, cemetery included. Hmm. Well, the city doesn't have the financial resources to maintain it. And they've got some structural problems and there's been some water damage and the cemetery is an absolute mess. And there's no way in the world Vallejo could sell Vallejo and still couldn't come up with the money to maintain this. So I introduced legislation to transfer ownership of that cemetery to the VA. Uh, they have a department within the VA to, um, uh, to maintain these, uh, these, uh, these sites. And what I'm doing um, is all the things that you would imagine. You get the American Legion, you get the VFW, you get all the different military groups to, uh, to sign on and, and to support the bill, uh, and, and, and you try and look for any support any way you can get it. Now, Senator Feinstein uh, introduced my bill in the Senate, so we have a House bill and a, and a Senate bill, and um, my staff has gone through, researched all the records to find out where these uh, 
Congressional Medal of Honor winners are from. My idea was find out whose congressional district they're native of and go to my colleagues in the House and say, hey, you've got a Congressional Medal of Honor winner uh, buried in a cemetery in my district, and the, c- and the cemetery is a mess. Can you sign on to this bill to help me? Well, sadly, the records aren't uh, going back that far, mm-hmm. uh, aren't what they are today. So all we've been able to find was the states that they're from. So shift gears, and instead of finding members of the House to co-author, now it's take the fight to members of the Senate. And there was uh, one of them we actually we, we don't know where, uh, where he's, he's, uh, he's from. We know that uh, he was born, I believe, in, uh, in uh, Scotland and then came over here and was in the military. And the only record they have on him is that he is buried, uh, got the Medal of Honor and is buried there. Other two, one from New Jersey, uh, one from Massachusetts. So uh, we are uh, going to the U.S. senators from those states saying, hey, sign up on Senator Feinstein's bill because you have a favorite son who won the Congressional Medal of Honor and his burial site is very disrespectful to him and to, uh, to the Congressional Medal of Honor. So you just try and figure out ways to get you know, different people to sign yeah. up and make, make your pitch. <clears throat> yeah. Now you're up for re-election. I am. And every two years. Every two years, <laughs> yeah. So, so you have an important job in doing what you do. How much does having to run for re-election every two years really affect what you can accomplish in D.C.? Well, I, I, I don't know if, if individually it, it means a lot. I, 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 just, I do my job. Uh, I'm not out on the campaign trail. I'm, you know, I've been in this uh, House seat for 20 years. I was in the state Senate for eight years. I'm in the district every weekend. Whenever we have a district work period, I'm in the district working. Uh, people know me. Uh, I'm very, very fortunate to have great support throughout the district. So I'm not doing campaign events every five minutes. I'm basically doing my, my job. Mm-hmm. Um, some of my colleagues, however, uh, live in and represent districts that aren't as friendly. And every year they have a, a, a race, and that's a real distraction. They're constantly calling people for campaign contributions. They're constantly doing uh, fundraisers, and I think it's a real distraction. Yeah, and I guess there's an argument to, I guess, possibly extend it by two years. I mean, what do you think? Uh, about? I, I don't think that will no. ever happen. Uh, it's in the Constitution prescribes the term limits or the, the time that, uh, uh, you, you're, that you're uh, elected in office. And I, I don't see that happening uh, in certainly in my lifetime, probably not uh, yeah. not yours. Mine's, but the yeah. distraction, uh, what, the, the bigger distraction, how it impacts somebody like me who has you know, a relatively safe uh, seat that they represent, it, it bogs down the work that you have to do. I've been doing a lot of work on gun violence prevention. And so you're trying to get a bill moved, trying to get co-authors on a bill. I'm trying to expand background checks to make sure everybody in the United States of America, if they buy a gun from a license, uh, uh, from, from a commercial sale, has to have a background check to make sure that they're not criminals or not uh, dangerously mentally ill. And so if you've got this— You would think that's just a common sense thing to have passed— I'm glad to see that you and I are both <laughs> in the within the 93 percent of the American people who believe yeah. that. Uh, but is you, that what the polling shows? Oh, yeah, 93 percent. More people support expanding background checks than believe in capitalism and ice cream. <laughs> wow. So, yeah. Um, but so you go to somebody and you say, you know, I need you to co-author this bill, and they say, well. I'm up for re-election right now, and I don't want to anger anybody. I better not do that. So it has an it has an impact on the process of representative government. Hmm. Interesting. So, so that's what you're trying to pass right now. Correct. Okay. It's one how of is the that, bills. One of the one bills. Of the I'm bills. To pass, yeah. Yeah. I mean, how's that looking? I mean, do you think? I I know you're running into some opposition. I have with, 204 co-authors. Uh, Democrats and Republicans. It's the most co-authors we've ever had on the bill. And uh, if we don't get it this Congress, we'll get it the next Congress. Yeah. And and one thing that's amazing to see is all the young people that are stepping up and really putting out their opinion. Um, I've told a few people when I grew up, 
in middle school, high school, no one ever talked about politics. Yeah. No one cared about politics. That was for your parents, right? But nowadays, everyone's so involved, and it's amazing to see how people are or students are walking out, but they're not walking out to skip out on class. They're coming out with a message of protest, and they're getting organized. And it's amazing to see that whole process of the younger generation getting involved. Yeah, it's not the first time it's happened. You know, it happened uh, with the uh, uh, Voting Rights Act. Uh, where young people it was it was predominantly young people that you know marched in Selma, Alabama, and and rallied on the college campuses to uh, bring attention to the fact that people were being discriminated against in regard to their ability uh, to vote. And then I know uh, when I was in Vietnam, uh, it was young p people who were protesting the war in Vietnam, and it's the young people that brought an end to the war in Vietnam. And I see the same thing in regard to gun violence. The uh, boy, I tell you, the uh, young uh, student leaders from Parkland uh, High School where those kids were shot in Florida, they were very, very powerful. Florida has never been much on passing gun legislation, and within a week or two— Yeah, they have one of the most relaxed laws, right? Oh, yeah. They, they passed a bill right away, and, and this governor from Florida who— you know, before then, you, you, you couldn't have, if you'll excuse, excuse the pun, you couldn't have held a gun to his head and made him sign a law uh, that, that dealt with guns. But he signed it right away. And I, I don't think it uh, was an oversight on their part uh, that there were 300,000 17-year-olds in Florida who were going to be eligible to vote in November. They, they, I'm sure that was in the back yeah. of their mind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and that's one thing that you see in a lot of those uh, organized student protests is a lot of them are saying, hey, look, we cannot vote right now, but wait another two years. You now know, we're I was, coming with power. I was so impressed with what happened uh, uh, with these young, uh, young leaders that I, I did a, a ceremony the other day, and I, I called all the schools in the county, and I said, uh, I'm going to recognize uh, student leaders and we're going to pick so many from each county. I'm going to have a big party for them, and I did. And, and, and we, we ended up, it was the first one we did. We're going to do it every year. It was great. Uh, we probably honored more uh, than you would ordinarily uh, honor. I'm going to cut it down, probably do two or three from each county. But uh, How some, many did you end up honoring? Oh, uh, there, were, there were a lot. There were probably 60, 70 uh, students. Wow. Uh, but every one of them had such an impressive resume and doing and not just not just working for gun violence prevention these are kids who are working to tutor uh, underprivileged kids working in a, in a healthcare field just amazing young people who are in fact true leaders and they are going to be the people that are leading uh, our district and our country and not to a uh, uh, distant future yeah so for I wouldn't be surprised if someday I was working for any one of those. <laughs> <laughs> so for someone that's a young person right now that want to or if they see themselves in the future in politics, what's your number one tip for them? Well, do well in school because that's real important. Um, you need to figure out how to be able to express yourself both orally and 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 and, and in written form. Uh, Learn to be analytical so you can uh, dissect an issue and understand why it's good or why, it, why it's bad, and, and get involved. There's a lot of ways to get involved. Uh, you mentioned this is campaign season. Everybody who has a campaign uh, needs volunteers. Go volunteer for somebody you believe in. And uh, if you want to do an internship, I have internships in all three of my district offices and in my Washington office where folks uh, – sign up to work a certain amount of time and they do uh, office chores and answer phones and meet constituents and help the staff out and help me out. Great. Now, what would you say would be the best part of you serving in the House? From, me, from my for perspective? For, yeah. Oh, I can tell you without hesitation. It's whenever you're able to help somebody. You know, when, my, my feeling is when somebody calls my office because they've got a problem, it's probably the last resort. And I've got story after story after story of people who've called up. They just didn't know where else to turn. They called our office. We got involved, and we helped them. And, and I sign. Every time we close a case, I write a letter to the folks and uh, explaining you know, what happened, uh, uh, sign the letter, send it to them. I ask them to fill out a form to, uh, so I get an idea of how well 
uh, our constituent service operation is working. And uh, I s just yesterday I signed a bunch of letters. There was one for, I think, $141,000 that someone had been owed by Social Security. Somebody else uh, was $27,000. No, it was $141,000 from a, a veteran, and he was a homeless veteran, and he had all this benefit coming, and he was homeless because he couldn't get it. So we took care of that for him. There was a $27,000 uh, from Social Security for someone, and and that you know that's gonna make or break somebody. Mm -hmm. And you think about think about being a homeless veteran. You have no place to go, and nobody is listening to you. They're not. You're not getting your your uh, your issues taken care of. And somebody took him to my office, and uh, my staff interviewed him. Uh, they opened a case on his behalf, and he, he gets one hundred and forty-one thousand dollars. Guy's in a home now. He has his own home. Uh, he's straightened up, cleaned up, interviewing for jobs. That's a, that's a life yeah. changer. So yeah, anytime I, I you recently, can do that, that's that's really important. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, I, that's more I, important than all those bills that are hanging on the wall. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I recently just found out about a program, uh, VASH through HUD, which helps veterans get into housing. They subsidize the housing. But then they help, and many of the veterans are homeless or have had problems, and they help them go through basically rehab and trying to get back into society with education and jobs. And it's a great program. And there's a lot of them out there that yep. need help. Yep. Yeah. Well, Congressman, I want to thank you for coming on to the podcast. Thank you so much. It was fun yeah, to do it. A lot of fun. And wine is great. And, uh, We'll have to do this again sometime soon. Sounds good. Yeah. Cheers and thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. Thank you to our producer, Sam Lemon. Please subscribe, like, comment, and share the podcast. Remember, you can listen to the podcast on iTunes, Podbean, iHeartRadio, Google Play, SoundCloud, and anywhere else you listen to podcasts. For more information on my business as a property manager and real estate team, go visit my website at markguzman.com. I really, really want to thank all of you for listening. It means the world to me, and I hope today's episode provides you value in your day-to-day -day life. I created this podcast to help showcase the many great people that live in this world and help share some knowledge that I've learned along the way in life. Again, thank you for listening. Check out our sponsors, and I'll catch you on the next episode.